bit more. Hey, Kaylee, Shante, Dave, DL. <clears throat> so guys, we're, uh, it's about four after right now. Uh, glad a few more of you jumped on. I'm sure some others will be joining us. Um, but I'm going to just out of respect of everybody's time, get going and introduce Jeff and let him get started on our uh, short term uh, rental investment <clears throat> training today. So I met Jeff because uh, he runs a management company called iTrip. You still work with your wife on that, Jeff? Yeah. yeah. So another hus husband and wife team, we have that in common. And uh, so they manage short term rentals. But uh, what I like about what they do is so, something that they can offer all of us for our clients is another option, right? We're always talking about options and giving our clients maybe a strategy that they didn't know about. Jeff's a great resource when somebody is looking at turning a property into a rental or acquiring a rental, maybe do a comparison, you know, depending on where it's located. What would that cash flow look like if it was uh, rented out through Airbnb, VRBO, managed by iTrip Vacations? What would that look like for your client versus putting in a annual long-term tenant right and i think you guys would be surprised um, at the cash flow difference and the projections they can make based on the right property in the right area so i'm gonna just turn it over to jeff he's gonna uh jeff maybe tell a little bit more about your background and about iTrip, and then you can jump right into your presentation yeah thanks jeff it's great to be with everybody and uh, this new way to meet and uh and co collaborate um my name's Jeff, as, as Jeff said, and uh, my company's called iTrip Vacations. Uh, I come from a property management background on the commercial side for, um, it'll be actually 20 years in December that I've been doing property management. Um, managed malls and shopping centers and office parks and um, just about everything in between. And uh, we, we got into iTrip last year. We just launched. iTrip is based out of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it's a franchise. There's about 90 franchises and there's over 3,300 properties uh, that are managed in the iTrip uh, platform. Um, that, um, oops, I'm going to share my screen here because that'll, uh, we'll start getting into this and, and I'll show you what the, uh, the kind of the overview is for, uh, for what we're going to be doing um, and talking about today. And, um, and I'll keep the, the chat box open. Um, so that if you guys have questions along the way, please um, feel free to uh, to ask a question and uh, and we'll answer it along the way. And then, or we, you can save it towards the end there, and, and we can go from there. Um, I guess that's going to show up on the screen if I show that. Um, so today we're just going to talk a little bit about investing in short-term rentals. Um, the uh, told you a little bit about me. Um, my wife also is running the business with us. Um, she does, I do a lot of the business development and um, my wife does the, uh, the onboarding of properties as we get them and uh, making them sound real nice. She's, she's got the more flowery language when doing descriptions uh, for the properties. But uh, um, as I, got, I mentioned a little bit about iTrip, we're also an elite partner with HomeAway and Verbo families. Um, there's only four, uh, software companies that are an elite partner with them. Uh, one of those is, uh, or excuse me, three. Uh, one of those is owned by HomeAway and it's a sister company. But uh, some just little tidbits of uh, Airbnb statistics in the U.S. Uh, there's over 66, 660,000 listings in the U.S. Um, that includes full homes, um, private bedrooms, and shared bedrooms. So that's all of the listings for Airbnb. Um, over and this was before COVID um, for this statistic, but over two million people stay in an Airbnb rental per night um, in the United States. So they they have quite the reach. Uh, worldwide, there's 150 million users with 41.4 uh, million users in 2019. Um, and then the this I thought was interesting. 54 percent of the guests are female, 46 percent of the guests are male. And then it uh, shows you a breakdown by uh, demographic. 81% of Gen Z has stayed in a short-term rental, 71% of millennials, 38% of Gen X, and then 20% of baby boomers. So you can see it's definitely, um, you know, in line with the tech and the modern world that we're in, you know, the younger generations are definitely involved in that. And they're also the ones who are doing a lot of traveling as well. Um, 
So what we'll go over with this, just a little bit, we'll talk a little bit about do-it-yourself versus professionally managed. Um, we'll, we'll discuss digital marketing and what that entails, uh, guest experience, uh, the importance of reviews, and then protecting the investment. We'll go through some uh, laws, ordinances, and regulations and what that looks like. Um, some smart pricing strategies and then some case studies. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about kind of where, um, where they sit right now uh, with the COVID and what's been happening there. Um, so do it yourself versus professionally managed. Obviously we do it professionally. This is our full-time job. Um, the, there's a lot of great do it yourselfers who do a really good job and they really like doing, um, doing uh, short-term rentals. They like interacting with the guests. Um, and, and they like everything about it. Um, I, I've, I've talked to a few people that they were in it, they were doing well with it, uh, but they hated dealing with the guests and so they ended up getting out of it because that was something they didn't necessarily like uh, to do. So, you know, for do it yourself, it is a part-time job. It does take time. You know, some days it's not, not, not a lot. Other days it, it might be more and depending on how many you're, you're managing, um, obviously that'll be, uh, or, needs to be taken into account. Um, you know, you get to keep all the profits. You're not sharing that with a management fee. Um, you know, there is a learning curve uh, when you are doing it by yourself um, and where you can get that help to be able to just talk through any situations you encounter. Um, typically there's less exposure just because a lot of the do-it-yourselfers are only on Airbnb. Uh, very few people um, list on both Airbnb and Verbo or other, um, booking platforms. Um, and then um, in general, um, you know, you, they, um, the do-it-yourselfers earn less than what a professionally managed um, property does. Um, there are do-it-yourselfers who do a great job and they beat the curve um, and, um, you know, make some, some really good money doing it. Hey, Jeff, I got a question for you. Um, yeah. You say most of them only advertise on Airbnb. Why is that? Do they not have the same access to some of the platforms or? Why yeah, wouldn't... I think so. When you do start managing it on multiple flat platforms, you have to manage the calendar. And so you, if you get a booking on Verbo, say, you need to make sure you go block it off on Airbnb or vice versa, um, where so you make sure you don't get a double booking. Gotcha. Um, that makes sense. And, and for hosts, you don't want to cancel. You know, your goal is to be a super host on Airbnb. If you cancel that, you lose your super host status. Um, so that helps you avoid, you know, they just don't have to manage two calendars is what it comes down to most of the time. Um, and so that's where, you know, for, for somebody like us, we have the software that manages the calendar. So when someone books, um, on Airbnb, it blocks out the calendar on all the 80 other plus booking sites that we're um, marketing on. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing is just, you know, calendar management and not wanting to pay for uh, the additional software to do that. There is software to do that, um, to help people do that, but it does come with a cost. So, um, you know, we do charge a management fee. Um, what, you know, we, our fee is to be able to free up the time for the owner. So that's one of the advantages. The owner just doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, we literally just send them the money at the end of the month. Um, you know, we're, we're experts in the field. We have access to not just um, what we have, but you know, we talk to the other 90 franchises. We have weekly calls. So we hear about what's happening in other parts of the, the country and what's working and what's not. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're listing on over 85 different listing sites, so the exposure is higher. Um, and typically, because we're on so many different listing sites, the gross revenue is higher, and we can usually justify our management fee um, for the owner just by earning you more money and then uh, freeing up your calendar. So, uh, but so, like I said, some people really enjoy it. My parents have a, a neighbor who rent out their basement um, and they love it. They get to know their people. They take them cookies. They make them brownies. They feed them brunch. Um, they really enjoy doing that. And, you know, it helps them make, make ends meet a little bit. Um, so digital marketing, um, you know, that's the marketing on Airbnb or Verbo or, or these other listing sites. Um, the way that they typically work with these sites is um, the, the higher, um, 
quality of photography that you have gives you a higher score, which ranks you higher uh, in the listing. So when somebody goes in there and they say, I want to go to um, solitude and, and go skiing and they put in solitude, the algorithms that they have will be able to see that, oh, this listing has higher quality photography. So it bumps you up and gets you on the first page. Um, so professional photography is very important. Um, it also, you know, enables you to be able to really showcase your property. Um, there's examples out there that, you know, just someone with their cell phone and it's dark, you can't really see what's going on. Um, that doesn't really help with being able to sell your property. Um, pictures are what sell the property. So, um, you know, headlines, taking advantage of the headline um, on the listing site. Um, you know, don't state the obvious. And, and we'll actually have an, an example here. Um, but, it, you know, people know that they're looking for a three bedroom. You don't need to state that you have a three bedroom in the headline. Save that space for being able to highlight your views or your location um, or your hot tub or the pool or your games or whatever else you have. Um, you know, describing and putting descriptions into each picture is important. It helps with the SEO strength. Um, people don't necessarily read those descriptions, but when they do, if they're just going to Google, you know, condo at solitude, it will help yours jump to the front of the list um, because you're taking the time to put in, um, you know, and after a long day skiing, enjoy sitting down in the hot tub and relaxing your muscles, however you want to say that. People don't take the time to read that, but it helps with the searching when people are looking for that. Um, you know, we talked about exposure on multiple sites. We're on, um, you know, like I said, over 85 different listing sites that encompass the entire world um, and we're marketing globally. So we also have a social media blog that links in and that helps with the um, search strength when people are looking to be able to have those blogs and those backlinks um, that help with the SEO strength as well. So digital marketing is important uh, just in the fact that it, it helps get you higher up the list and get your property noticed um, before people get tired of searching through the, all the different properties. Um, we talked about an example of headlines. You know, the first headline, Kodiak cabin, three bedroom, three and a half bath, pigeon forge, luxury cabin with amazing mountain views. Well, they already know that you're, you know, they're looking for a three bedroom or, or that's part of their search criteria only. So you don't really need that. So you can shorten it to, you know, Smoky Mountains, Luxury Cabin, and Pigeon Forge, two stories with views, private hot tub. And, you know, even better, you know, they, they know that where they're looking already is Pigeon Forge. So spacious Smoky Mountain cabins with views and hot tub. You know, get as much information, make it as concise so that when people look at it, because they're looking at it quickly, you know, you just have a split second to grab their attention with, your headline and that very first picture you put up um, is super important uh, for what people are going to look at and to grab their attention so that they'll come look at your property. Um, these are just, uh, we call this the spider web. These are the distribution channels that we take advantage of, not just, um, you know, Airbnb and, and Verbo and HomeAway, um, but Priceline, Hotels.com, Orbitz, villas, you know, all these other places. There's um, uh, places that are country specific, like this Alugi Temporada, um, FIWO Direct, you know, those are places that are specific to countries that we're also looking at and, and doing. You know, we also retarget with our marketing. So if somebody clicks on the link, um, you know, they will get um, for three days, they will get, hey, looks like something happened, um, you know, We'd love to host you, whatever um, you know that is. So we're retargeting and hoping to be able to keep them coming back if they have not made their decision yet. Um, so and then also social media and Pinterest and all those. Um, you know, in in 2019 we had over 100 million um, reaches for 2019. Um, another important. Uh, experience with that, and this is becoming more and more true, is that people don't just want a place to stay, they want an experience when they go there. And when they, it, it makes it more emotional for them. 
And so when they'll remember that experience when they go back. So a little bit about what we do to help, you know, with the guest experience is we have a partnership with a company called Explore that offers, uh, they have an option for a free ticket to the um, Olympic Park up in Park City. Um, there's a, uh, what's it called? I'm drawing a blank now. It's an escape room or Enigma escape room is what it is. They get a free pass to the Enigma escape room or they can get, and Dave and Buster's right now is closed, so it's not an option, but typically we have, you know, a free dinner to Dave and Buster's uh, in that. Um, we also have, you know, partnerships with Snack Dash, which will come up and pre-stock their groceries and buy the groceries for them. So they just show up, their fridge is full with everything that they order. Um, if they need baby equipment, you know, we can help them with the baby equipment, with strollers, car seats, um, whatever. Uh, that they need to to be able to bring their kids along. Um, you know, the, the updated design and decor, as I go through and I've looked literally at, um, you know, over a thousand different properties as I'm doing these revenue projections that Jeff mentioned, and, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on what is involved with that in a little bit, but you can definitely see a difference between those properties that are intentional in their design and their decor versus someone who just, thought, hey, I've got grandma's old couch and stuff and we're gonna put them in and, and give it a go and see what we can do for on Airbnb. Um, amenities um, that are offered, you know, do you have game rooms, hot tubs? Um, is there a community pool or do you have a private pool? Um, those are all things that people are looking at and making their booking decisions. Um, and then, you know, a, we provide a starter pack um, you know, of, of essentials. So we provide not just the individual sizes, but we give something a little different. So we're not using as much plastic um, and having as much waste go through there. So we provide, you know, small bottles that are probably about 10 ounces of shampoo and conditioner and, and body wash um, for people to use. And then also being proactive um, with your communication with the guests. Um, you know, when they, when they book, um, you know, reach back out to them. A lot of times people will say, I'm coming to town for my daughter's wedding. We just had that with a booking yesterday. Um, you know, respond back to them. Oh, that's great. You know, ask them questions about themselves, their families. If they don't necessarily tell you why they're coming, ask them why they're coming. Learn more about them. And then um, also offer to give your local help. People love to be able to have that uh, kind of locals inside experience. And being able to say, hey, here's where the locals go. Here's where, what the locals are doing. Um, here's this little restaurant that we really like that nobody really knows about. Giving them those options and those opportunities, the guests love that, um, which all you know, tie into to the review. Um, reviews are essential. They're, they're the most important thing that we're looking for. So one review will increase bookings by 40%. 95% uh, of people are looking at reviews prior to booking. And then 70% of consumers are saying reviews are the second best form of advertising that they have. So reviews are essential. It helps you not only to be able to grab people's attention, but when you have those reviews and they're strong reviews and they're good reviews, um, it lets you increase your nightly rate because people will book that, they see that they're getting a good experience, they see that you're responsive and you can start pushing that nightly rate higher um, than what the average is for the area. So reviews are, are essential and one of the most important things that we do, we actively go out and we're looking for reviews. They get reminders from whoever they book through, uh, but we also have reminders that go out to them through our own marketing to say, hey, we're glad you stayed with us. You know, please leave us a review um, so that we can keep building. Uh, that property and, and it builds on itself. Um, pricing strategy is also important. Um, you need to be aware, obviously, as you guys do as real estate agents, when you're listing a home, um, it's the same strategy. You don't want to be too high. You don't want to be too low um, and leave money on the table. Um, part of what we do when we start a property, we put it just a little bit below, um, you know, say the average market uh, nightly rate because we want to get bookings and you want to drive the traffic there, get the people in. It's not about making money those first 
three to four months, it's about getting the reviews. Um, so that's part of what we do in our pricing strategy. We price it low, entice people to come, give them that great experience um, so that they give you those reviews. Um, you know, know when your tourist seasons and your market demands are. A lot of people just set it and forget it. They look at it, they might do the research, they say, you know, the average nightly rate is $100 a night, and they just put their entire year at $100 a night and let it go. Um, they're leaving a lot of money on the table. They're losing opportunities to maybe book it when the occupancy is down. Um, and so you need to make sure that you know when people are coming. Um, for instance, in September, down at, it obviously won't be this year, but typically in September in Salt Lake, um, there's the one week, and I don't remember who's downtown at the, the convention center, but they bring in like 30,000 people and the nightly, the average nightly rates for Airbnbs and for hotel rooms almost triples for just that one week. Um, so you leave a lot of opportunity on the table if you're not taking advantage of that. Um, you know, amenities help with the pricing as well. If you have a hot tub, hot tub, you can start increasing your rates and take advantage of that. You will make your money back with a hot tub within one year. Um, you know, game rooms, if, if you've got a pool table or a ping pong table or something else or a card table um, or a theater room, um, those are things you take into account as well. And then you want to be transparent. You don't want to hide anything so that when people book that they, um, they get some surprise fees. Um, and then dynamic pricing refers to taking advantage of those market demands in the tourist season. Um, like for instance, our software will automatically look at the occupancy of the area that we tie it to, and it will adjust the nightly rate depending on what that occupancy is. So as we get closer to the booking date, if the occupancy is low, they'll start, their, our system will automatically start lowering that rate to be able to take advantage of who is out there looking and to maybe entice them to come to you so you don't lose out on anything. And vice versa, if the demand is high, it will start increasing the rate, knowing that there's not a lot of options and people are gonna to have to pay that fee. Um, and so those are things that, you know, we still do go in manually each week. We look at pricing and where the comparables are, um, but our system also does a lot of that for us. So, um, you know, protecting your investment. As, when you have people, you know, a lot of the horror stories are that there's going to be parties, that they don't take uh, treat your place well. Um, we've had um, in the one plus year and the over 200 and some odd uh, bookings that we've had, we've had one party that really caused a problem. Everybody else has been really good. Um, we haven't, you know, even people that do end up breaking something, uh, they typically will give you a, a quick note or a text and say, hey, this glass broke or hey, the towel um, thing came out of the wall, the towel holder came out of the wall, and they'll let you know. Um, but so, you know, you do have your homeowner's insurance. The online travel agencies is what they're referred to in the industry, or Airbnb and Verbo. They also offer insurance coverage um, for people. So if someone does book through Verbo and they break stuff in your home, you can go back through their insurance to get it. And then instead of always using your homeowner's. Um, and then, you know, we also provide insurance. We give the uh, guests an opportunity to book travel insurance as well that they can have to protect their travel. So in case something happens, they're covered. Um, we also use smart home devices. We have a device um, that monitors noise levels. It monitors the home temperature, the humidity, um, motion um, detection, and... Um, there's one other thing I don't remember right now what it, um, that fifth thing, but you know, we get a notice if they're too loud and you know, we put the, the parameter at say 85 decibels for more than 10 minutes, um, we get notified of that. We can contact the, the guest and say, hey, Jeff, uh, you're being a little too loud. You know, we wanna be respectful of the neighbors. Um, you know, can you please keep it down? So there's ways to be able to do that and to be able to stay on top of that um, without having to always go to the property. Um, regulations, this is always a, a big question um, that I receive, um, you know, what city allows what? Every city 
is different. Every city um, administers it different. And every city has um, their willingness to enforce it. So for instance, Salt Lake City itself does not allow short-term rentals. But if you go into Salt Lake City on the uh, software that I have that where I gather all my data to provide revenue projections, um, it has over 1,500 single family home listings in Salt Lake City, but it's technically not allowed in Salt Lake City. Um, so what Salt Lake City does, when, it, when I've talked to them they, and I've asked them that question, well, we'll only enforce if a neighbor complains. So they're basically turning the other, or looking the other way, um, unless one of the neighbors calls and complains and says, hey, you know, Jeff's got this short-term rental over on this street, um, and they're being too noisy, I don't like having them here, then they will go investigate. Um, every city I've talked to is pretty much that way. You do get more enforcement with smaller cities. So for instance, Washington um, City down, down south, they are a little more strict with their enforcement, so is St. George. Um, you go up to Huntsville, um, they're more strict because they have the resources to do that. But some of these bigger cities like Sandy, um, you know, they have some allowances for short-term rentals, but they don't have the resources to just send somebody out and enforce that day in and day out. So again, they just look at if a neighbor complains, we'll enforce it. And a lot of that stems from this House Bill 253 that passed in 2017. Um, it basically says that a city, what the cities used to do is they used to go on to Airbnb or Verbo and look and say, hey, this house is listed as a short-term rental and they start finding them or cracking down on them. This House Bill 253 said, you can't do that. It's a free speech issue. They can go list it wherever they want. You have to get hard proof that people are actually staying there as a short-term rental. Because if nobody's staying there, they technically haven't broken a law or your city ordinance, except when somebody stays there. So just because they have it listed, you've got to go get hard proof. So, hey, Jeff, I have a question on that, um, on enforceability. So let's say I've got a rental in a city that doesn't allow short-term rentals and I'm renting it anyway. Um, is that a disclosure that you have the tenants, the people that are occupying the property uh, made aware of um, to kind of to enforce that uh, no noise policy or whatever? No, we, we haven't done that. Um, it would probably drive a lot of guests away if they thought there was an opportunity that um, the city would be showing up during their stay, um, which would in turn lead to a bad review. Um, so that's why we always check with the cities. Um, you know, we try and talk to the neighbors around there and let them know what's going on and have the owners talk to them as well and say, hey, this is what we're gonna be doing. Majority of people um, have used it. They like traveling like that. Uh, most people in our experience have been very good with it. And, um, but you don't have to disclose that. Um, here in Utah, they're not going to kick them out. They're just going to send a notice to the homeowner and say, uh, Jeff, you know, we were made aware that you're using your property as a short term rental. Here's our ordinance. It's not allowed. You need to stop. Um, they're not going to crack down. I've, I've heard of stories where in Florida they do show up in places where it's not allowed. So, uh, but you, here in Utah, you know, they're not going to show up if there's a guest there and do something with the guests. So. Um, cities know what's happening. Um, they actually benefit from it. So Airbnb actually pays the um, lodging taxes and the sales taxes on behalf of every booking that is made on their platform. So the cities are benefiting from having short-term rentals in their uh, cities. Um, like we said, enforcement is a little tricky just because most cities don't have the um, resources and the, the manpower to be able to um, go after it on a full-time basis where you really need to be careful is with HOAs. Um, HOAs do have that ability. They do have the resources. They're dealing with a much smaller uh, area that they have to, you know, instead of a, a city with thousands of, of rooftops, you know, they're dealing with uh, a community that maybe has 50 to 100. Um, so they do crack down. If there is um, something happening, they will notify you. We had 
uh, one owner in Lehigh, you know, our first question usually is, is, is there an HOA? And he said, yeah, there is, but it's okay, I checked. So we took him for his word. We started listing it. We got it booked um, and we're doing really well with it. And about six weeks in, he got a notice from the HOA saying, we found it listed. You can't do this. You've got to have at least six month um, renters in there. So, you know, that was one we ended up losing just because he, he claims he checked with the HOA, but uh, didn't really do much to, to verify that. So, um, you know, good places to invest. That's a question I get a lot. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to that question because a lot is gonna depend on the situation and what the goals are for the person. Um, a lot of people use, you know, short-term rentals to be able to help them make ends meet. So their goal maybe is they're just trying to make 500 to 1,000 bucks a month to help cover the mortgage or to buy some groceries or to do some other stuff. Um, so their investment is a little bit different than somebody who's looking for just say pure cash flow and being able to, to use it as an investment property. Um, you know, in general, um, and I've got a case study that we'll look at here in a little bit that's from Mill Creek. Um, I like Mill Creek area. Um, downtown uh, Marmalade District is really good. Anything kind of downtown area from 7th East, you know, going west of I-15. Um, and then, you know, for a lot of Utahns who are familiar with the area, this is usually surprising, but uh, Rose Park and Glendale areas actually uh, has some properties that do very well, um, you know, based on their sales price and what revenue they can generate. And typically the rule of thumb, thumb that I found as, and this has changed a little bit too now that interest rates are, are lower, but you need about $10,000 in revenue for every $100,000 of sales price. So if, you, if you're gonna buy a place for 400,000, you want about $40,000 in revenue. And that's with, with iTrip managing it, um, you know, and taking that completely off your, um, your plate. Um, you would still be able to make a pretty good return and you would be able to cash flow. Um, obviously, if there's do-it-yourselfers out there and they want to do that and they can generate that income, you know, obviously that's more in their pocket, um, but it does, you know, take a little bit more work for them to be able to do that. Um, you know, so there's a lot depends on the basis in the property. If it's a property that you've held for a long time versus one you're just now buying where, you know, you guys as real estate agents know better than anybody else you know, where home prices are and how much they've gone up in the last, um, you know, five years or so. Um, and so all those things have to be taken into account and what the ultimate goals are for the, the person purchasing it. Um, I spoke with somebody last week who's looking for a place up at Solitude. He's not necessarily looking to make money. If it makes money, that's great. Uh, but he would like to break even because he know he's gonna plan on going up and using it, um, you know, during the summertime and during the ski season. And so that's something that he wants to be able to do it with it. Um, another owner that we have up there in, in Solitude, um, you know, he, he used it over uh, the 10 days of Christmas, you know, between the 20th of December to January 1st. That's the highest rate up at Solitude is over Christmas. And so his goal is just to use it for the enjoyment of he and his family and everything else. It's just, you know, kind of gravy on top. So he doesn't really care about breaking even, even, um, you know, he just wants it for use of his family. So there's a lot that goes into that question and, and a lot that uh, can go, but in general, um, you know, the, the newer or the, the remodeled looking homes will do much better. They get way more attention. Um, than the older looking homes. Uh, we've got a property that we brought on in December down in Orem uh, that started out pretty good, but now that we've got into the summertime, it's just, it's booking like crazy and it's been a really good prop property. Um, and we're gonna really beat, even with COVID and what we lost because of COVID in March and April, we're gonna beat the projections that we gave to the owners when they were looking at it, which is great, um, you know, to be able to go back to them and say, hey, you know, you were getting this to be able to use, they come up and use it frequently. 
Um, but you know, we're we're doing much better than what even we thought during this first year. A lot of it helps that Utah County has a lot of weddings <laughs> going on down there, and a lot of people we have coming are booking for weddings. Um, so, and that one's right on Sleepy Ridge, if you're familiar with Sleepy Ridge Golf Course. Um, it's just right down there, just west of I-15, just off Geneva Road. So, Hey, Jeff, it sounds like that's pretty common that a lot of your clients um, buy a property that they want to use themselves um, as like a vacation home and then rent it out yeah. in the meantime just so they can afford that second home or vacation yeah. home. Yeah, exactly. You know, they, they like the idea of being able to come up and use it. Um, you know, they get the appreciation out of it. And if they can, you know, pay most of the bills and not dump as much money into it as they otherwise would, um, you know, that's their ultimate goal. So yeah, we, we do have quite a few that that's their, their number one goal is just to be able to use it for their family. But I would assume it would also be good for portfolio investors too, right? Do you ever take a look at people's properties that are uh, currently renting them long term and kind of do an analysis on if they converted it over? Yes, we've, we've done that a number of times. Um, rental rates in Utah with just the housing situation, the long-term rental rates are, are high enough that it's, um, by the time you start to invest the money into furnishing the property, because on a three bedroom, three or four bedroom, you're gonna spend about fifteen to $20,000 to furnish it. Um, so that can be prohibitive, even if the cash flow might be a little bit better, you know, your payback on that might be longer than what some investors are comfortable with. Um, so we have done that in, in a number of different areas. Um, so what makes a good short-term rental? You know, obviously location. Um, you know, those areas I mentioned before, the Marmalade District, Glendale, Rose Park, Mill Creek, Sugar House, um, you know, they're, set, they're close to downtown, but you can also jump up and go to Park City and you're in Park City in less than 30 minutes. You can get up to Big and Little Cottonwood Canyon. So there's a lot of opportunity there for people to be able to come and be centrally located um, and, and being able to get to where they want to go. Um, as I've mentioned this a couple times, an updated decor and an updated home um, is invaluable. Um, it, it's amazing to look as I'm doing these revenue projections for, for people and looking at the comparables. And you see one that's doing um, you know, I'm just grabbing some numbers. It might be doing 40,000 and one nearby is only doing 20,000. Well, you start digging into it and you look at it and the one doing 40,000, it, it looks nice. It's decorated. They're intentional. You know, the one doing 20,000, maybe that's, they're really happy with that, but they could be doing better. But, you know, the pictures aren't great. Um, you know, the, it's not updated. You can tell it's a little a little older style and whatnot. So, you know, it makes a big difference. Um, the, amazingly enough, the kitchen is the first place people look. 64% of people booking say the kitchen is the most important amenity that they're looking for. Um, so typically, you know, unless there's a really cool room or family room or dining room, you know, the kitchen is one of the first five pictures that you're gonna put in there. Um, bedrooms are next and then amenities um, like pool hot tub and game room are actually after kitchen and bedrooms and what they're looking for so um, those are still important and they will help increase your revenue to be able to have those but people look at, at the inside first um, so where's the short-term market now um, Obviously when COVID hit in March, you know, we lost all but two bookings that we were able to move uh, to a later time um, for March and April. Um, so that was just brutal. But even with that, you know, May, June and July have actually turned out to be pretty good. Um, so Salt Lake annual revenue is only down about 9%. Sandia annual revenue is down about 15 and down Washington down in Southern Utah is down about 14. You know, all things considered, when you lose about six weeks worth of bookings um, plus extra, you know, it, it bled over into May um, and fewer people are traveling. Um, you know, it's not as bad as it could be. Um, hotels are, are in much worse situation. Um, bookings for short-term rentals in June were up 20% over 2019. 
a lot of that was because people were just tired of sitting around. They were tired of being cooped up. And so in bookings for June just kind of went through the roof once Florida started to loosen restrictions, uh, once Alabama and all these beach places um, along the, the Atlantic coast. And um, when they opened up, bookings just went crazy. Um, the trend now is that people are, are traveling closer to home. They're traveling to where they can drive instead of fly. Um, you know, they're looking for new places they maybe haven't been. Uh, we've got two properties in St. George, um, in, in Washington actually, and both those properties are getting people who are first time travelers to Zions, um, you know, down and into Southern Utah. They haven't ever been there before and they're coming because they're from Southern California, they're from Nevada and Los Angeles and they're looking for somewhere new to go that's different, that's opened up, that doesn't have restrictions. Um, so they're keeping it close to home where they can drive. Um, with that said, you know, the industry consensus right now is, you know, people feel more comfortable booking a short-term rental versus a hotel because you control who's coming and going into that home. Um, you know, you know where your whole group's been Whereas in a hotel, you know, whoever just went up to the third floor, who pushed the elevator button, you don't know where they've been, you don't know where they're coming from. Um, if they've been in contact with somebody that's had COVID, there's just, you know, there's more opportunities it feels like with hotels. They do have great cleaning um, protocols in place, just like we do. You know, we follow all the CDC's guidelines for cleaning. Our cleaners wear masks and gloves while they're in the property cleaning. Um, so there are precautions being taken, but you, you can control who's coming and going into a short-term rental. Um, you know, with that said, if restrictions start cropping up again, um, you know, that's gonna affect bookings. Um, there's, a, there's an iTrip franchise down in uh, Jacksonville where they were supposed to be holding the Republican convention. And as soon as they mentioned that they weren't going to be holding it, they start they all their bookings for whenever the convention was called and started canceling. Um, so it's still, you know, everybody's walking on eggshells right now. Um, I, I call it a little bit of a white knuckle experience where you're just holding on. Um, people before COVID were booking out 30 days on average um, in advance. Now they're booking 10 to 14 days in advance. So People are waiting to make sure that, hey, I want to go somewhere, but I want to make sure that I can get to where I'm going and not have to have it canceled or have things shut down. Um, here's a, just a quick little case study. Um, this is a different one than I did last time, Jeff. Um, it's, uh, it's updated. It's, it's in Mill Creek. It's on 39th South and about 4th East. It's actually some townhomes where they do allow short-term rentals. Um, it looks like that didn't save. It's actually a three bedroom, three bath. And, uh, you know, it's uh, the uh, average. So this is part of what I'll do for you as real estate agents is put together these revenue projections. So their revenue projection started out at about 44,000. Um, and then we put kind of, we look at the highest performing properties um, that are in the market. And we say, here's what our target is. There is a ramp up period. You know, you don't just list it and all of a sudden you're getting bookings. Those first two to three months, you will receive bookings and you'll get people coming. Um, but to be able to get it to where it's really humming and, and a well-oiled machine, it takes three to six months to kind of get there. That's what's happening with this Orem property. You know, we started out good. Uh, we had bookings, we got the good reviews. And now that we've got those, it's just, it's really booking and that's the one I was really surprised yesterday on that property, we got a booking for October, um, which just hasn't happened that far out since uh, March. Um, so that's what this upper number is. This is kind of saying, hey, here's where we think we eventually can get to, um, but here's the average. And what we do is we just look at the comparable properties, we look at their average occupancy and then their average nightly rate. Um, and we provide this to you as the agent, and then you as the agent can take this to your client and say, hey, Here's some information that we have. This is where it's coming from. And it gives them a good sense of um, what they can actually do in this. And you can take it and look at it as a long-term or if they're just trying to buy it because they wanna come and stay and visit family 
and they say, oh, that's great. I can maybe pay for most of it um, with that. So this is, this is one of the services that I offer for agents uh, to be able to help you guys help your clients um, and be able to close deals. Um, this just shows where the comparable properties are. So this is the subject property. These other little spots are the comparables. I, I usually just take five of the comparables to put in there. And so, you know, we've got the five down in here um, and then it gives an average and that's where we're coming up with that. Um, you know, a lot of properties, depending on what they have, obviously can perform better than the average. Um, but we just kind of take what's out there and, and give you a good idea of what to expect. Um, this, this spreadsheet here is something I also will give to agents to use. It's not fancy, it's just a simple cash on cash return to be able to look at it. So these purchase price for those townhomes are $419.9. Um, you know, there's what a down payment would look like um, for each of these different options. The revenue, oh, I didn't fix that. That didn't save. Um, you know, there's the management fees taken out, the HOA and utilities, we plug that in. Um, we calculate the mortgage, we estimate the taxes and insurance, and then we give you a before tax cash flow and then a cash on cash return. Um, you know, so all you really need to fill in is the yellow spots and then which, you know, I'll give you the revenue, the HOA, you know, and utilities can usually be pretty well estimated. And then you know what the purchase price is to kind of give, and then you need to know the interest rate. Um, this might be a little high. I took it a little higher than, than what rates are now. I talked to a lender I know, and he said, you can get anywhere between three and a half to four right now is a really good rate to 4.2 for uh, an investment property. So that's where, where that came from. But you can see that, um, you know, just a little bit over a 5% return, plus you're getting that appreciation um, and you get a place to stay if you wanna use it when it's not being used, um, which saves you money on hotel or, or other travel expenses. Um, so, what, you know, we discussed a little bit for your buyers and for your um, your clients will give you a rental forecast um, and it includes details. This first page is just a summary. Um, if someone just wants to know what the bottom line is, um, it gets a little bit more detailed about who we are, about iTrip vacations, um, some testimonials. Um, you know, this page starts diving into the details as far as what the net revenue is. You know, it shows what the gross annual revenue is and then what the occupancy is. And then this is in the blue here. This is what the owner can expect in their, um, into their pockets each year. Um, for those people who are a little more sophisticated, you know, and, and want to know what cap rates are and know what cap rates are, you know, it calculates a cap rate for them to be able to compare their different options for investments. Um, you know, we give you an analysis on the average daily rate and kind of where that's going to fall in, um, you know, where, where it drives bookings, you know, the upper end is where there's, um, you know, there might be a big event in the area, so you're being able to push it, or the lower occupancy times where your rate's going to end up uh, just to drive occupancy. Um, this we've shown you this page with just the comparable properties and what they are. Um, it's kind of hard to see probably for you guys there, but um, right over here, it says 72%. So when on this projection here, which was um, Sugar House area, 72% of the properties in this area are listed on Airbnb only. 11% of the properties are on HomeAway only and 17 properties are listed on both. So you can see that the opportunities to be able to get, gain more exposure we found in our area, we get about half our bookings from Airbnb and half from the Verbo family. Verbo and HomeAway are the same company. And we're almost evenly split between those two. Um, and then the rest of them come just through our iTrip um, software and, and people that reach out to us directly. Um, you know, this looks at more pricing and kind of where that optimal zone is for pricing. Um, market occupancy rates versus um, you know, where we're projecting your rates for this property and where they fall in. Um, this looks at kind of the monthly revenue and the ups and downs and 
you know, where the, uh, the slow and the high seasons might be. You can see sugar house is pretty steady. Um, it does, you know, February, March are higher with ski season and then June and July is higher with, um, with summer vacationers coming into town. So, um, and then just, this just projects out over a couple of years and saying, if you just increase, I think we use two and a half percent. Um, here's what your revenue might look like over the next five years. So, um, you know, that's a little bit about what we do, where the short term market is and what's going on. Um, you know, appreciate the opportunity, Jeff, to be able to, to, you know, share this with you guys. And if there's anything, you know, please feel free to email me or text or, or give me a call if you have questions and any clients that you have uh, that are looking for help and, and want some information, you know, we're more than happy to be able to help you guys out. Our goal is, you know, to help agents to be able to close deals. And obviously our end goal is, you know, we hope to be able to meet those owners and um, hopefully manage it for them. If they don't want to manage it, you know, we're more than happy to, uh, we've got a little book that we give to people that are the do it yourself or do it yourselfers um, to be able to help them get a jump start on marketing and everything that they're doing. So we're more than willing to help out wherever we can. Hey, Jeff, <clears throat> this is Rand. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. Hi, this is really an interesting, super interesting uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm at that space and in, in, we've got a, a place up at Bear Lake. Um, and uh, as I as I listen to your presentation, I have two questions. A, do you, one of the things that we have toyed with is buying a condo down in, say, San Diego. Uh -huh. Do you do you handle properties uh, in California as well? So I, I don't personally, but iTrip does have franchise owners down there in Southern California doing the San Diego area. So we can okay. definitely get you in contact with them. All right, let me let me pose one more question, and I shared it with Jeff. Um, when when you're talking about it's ill, you know, against the ordinance in a particular city, you know, for me, um, I happen to be married to uh, uh, Jesus's sister, so um, anything that might be even considered <laughs> considered <laughs> illegal or you know, what I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is could that come back and bite you in the butt? You know, let's say you, you we, we ran it, you know, we bought a place here in town, um, but it's against the ordinance. To me, that is a, you know, that's a red flag. I mean, is, can you speak to that for just a sec? Yeah, so every city, so I've talked to the, the city planners um, at Salt Lake, Murray, uh, Cottonwood Heights, Sandy, and Draper. Draper, by the way, is, is legal. They don't have any ordinance. Um, and Draper, we've got two properties in Draper that are really doing very well. Um, so Draper's not an issue. Um, all four of those other cities, when we've talked to them, and we say, what are you, you know, I, so here's, here's what I do when I call. I say, hey, what are your rules? I'm interested in possibly doing a short-term rental. What are your rules for your city? And they'll go through the, what their rules are and I say, okay, great, thank you. What about the ones that are existing that don't, that aren't, you know, that are, are not legal? What, what do you do about those that, um, you know, for instance, Salt Lake City, it's, it's not allowed, period. There's no, there, there's nothing like Sandy and Cottonwood Heights, you can be legal within certain uh, rules and you can be fine. Murray and, and Salt Lake, it's technically not legal at all, but both cities have said, yeah, we know what's going on. We don't do anything unless a neighbor complains. I mean, th that's literally what they've said is, we don't do anything unless a neighbor complains. We don't have the resources to be able to be actively enforcing what is going on and to be able to go after these illegal um, short-term rentals. Great. So it, is, it is, you have to be able to be flexible. So is what I tell people, if, if you're gonna do it, you know, your chances of being caught are pretty slim, but if you get caught, you know, transition over to a long-term rental and uh, you know, go, go that route if you want, so. Great, thank you so much. Yeah.
So Jeff, I think you kind of answered uh, the question when you were talking to Rand about San Diego. I know we got some uh, people on the phone here from other states, so they can just reach out to you uh, directly and then you could help them find the person in their area that might uh, yeah. be able to do these type of projections for them as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where, you know, for, for iTrip vacations, where we feel like our niche in the market is, is instead of me trying to say, hey, here's what San Diego's like, I honestly don't have a clue about anything in San Diego, but I can refer you to somebody who has that experience. They're the boots on the ground and they can give you much better detail and information than what I ever could. And so that's where we really feel like iTrip is set apart from everybody else is we give you that mom and pop service, that local uh, boutique level service, but we're big enough that we have the resources to be able to market globally and to be able to really take advantage of our size. Um, by putting everyone's resources together. So, No, I think that's perfect um, because even our local clients might want to buy in a different market, right? Somewhere yeah. where they might want a vacation. And uh, that's, that's what we would do as a realtor anyway, right? Is we refer our clients to somebody in that local market that can serve them best. Yeah. So kind of the same thing. Yep. So, well, does anybody else have any other questions or comments? Uh, Jeff, thanks so much. Uh, we're kind of right at the top of the hour. So if anybody else wants to jump in, we'll give them a minute. I don't think there's anything in the chat. Yeah, it's good info, Jeff. It gives us another option for our clients um, uh, that are investing in real estate or that want to maybe get into that. So um, hopefully uh, you'll have some of the agents reach out to you. And, and I'm always happy. I've got, um, you know, like that revenue projection that I did for that Mill Creek property. Um, and I've, I've met with the developer there. Um, you know, they're looking to market to investors. Um, so I, I've shown him my projections. He, he likes them. If you're interested in places like that, I've got a couple others that I can give you. I'm more than happy to send those to you for you to send to your investors who are maybe out and looking and saying, hey, here's an opportunity um, that's out there, you know, to, and something to take a look at. So Nice. Nice. I like it. In fact, why don't you go ahead and... Uh send me those uh, here locally that you know of uh, just to prepare for being able to share that with others. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right, guys, if there's nothing else, we're going to sign off. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate the opportunity again to be with you. Sorry it wasn't in person, but. Uh, no, hopefully next time. Hopefully soon, yeah. I'm getting tired of Zoom, I got to admit. <laughs> yes. All right, guys, have a good rest of your day. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Yep. See ya.